introduced me to while I was uh, uh, teaching and working in Europe. Um, it was presence at the same time meeting Zepp at my workplace in Germany and then speaking to him about his book and then encouraged by another wonderful Italian historian friend, Eduardo Tortorella, I proposed a special number on presence for that very well-known journal called Storia della Storiografia. Now, this brought Ethan and me together. And from presence to present, it has been a wonderful personal and academic journey ever since. History and Theory, um, History and Theory, uh, the journal that uh, 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 that, that Ethan now is the editor in chief, was perhaps the finest journal, perhaps the finest journal in historical film in the academy today, where uh, I was published in 2007. So that was my first collaboration with Ethan. And, uh, and, and then again in 2015, um, uh, 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 what happened is that it's brought me with a one, again, I got published in 2015, but that actually brought me into a community of friends, wonderful friends and scholars like Frank Ankersmeet, Jan Rusen, and Hayden White. Now, this academic collaboration that we both had, it led to our book, uh, The Presence, which Cornell University Press brought out in 2013. But today, we still continue to collaborate and we are planning a co-authored book that is still in the making. Ethan must be smiling at this. And with this Boy Distinguished Lecture Series, we are again on the same portal and the same page. I'm extremely happy to uh, showcase his excellent work on deconstruction in history today. And we are honored to invite him to share his thoughts on his book, Haunting History, which Stanford University Press brought out in 2017. Well, Ethan Kleinberg, to be a little more formal now, is the class of 1958 Distinguished Professor of History and Letters at Westland University and is the Editor-in-Chief of History and Theory. Kleinberg's wide-ranging scholarly work, it spans across the fields of history, philosophy, comparative literature and religion. He had written a Generation Existential Martin Heidegger's Philosophy in France, 1927 to 1961, a book that Cornell published, Cornell University Press published in 2006, and very recently wrote Emmanuel Levinas's Talmudic term, Philosophy and Jewish Thought from Stanford University Press in October 2021. It's my pleasure to invite him today on behalf of the department and all the people who have supported and cheered the progress and evolution of Bowie Lecture Series we extend an extremely warm welcome to you. So over to you, Ethan. Well, th thank you, uh, Ranjan, and thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. And of course, the, the Boy Lecture Series for this opportunity. I, I have to, um, to just uh, uh, second um, the sense of emotion and joy. Uh, 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 Ranjan and I have been working together now for, for quite some time. It almost... Um, uh, sets me aback to realize how long it is, because of course, that uh, time has passed quite a bit. But it's been a wonderful collaboration, and as uh, Ron John suggested, we have been working on this uh, uh, book that keeps getting deferred. In in part because Ron John keeps publishing other books, he seems to be incredibly productive with this. Uh, I trot along with the occasional book now and then, but. Uh, we're getting closer, and I think uh, as our administrative duties seem to, to dissipate, we're, we're about to hit the launch pad. So, um, as, as Ranjan suggested, uh, I am today going to focus on um, uh, haunting history. Uh, the, my, my book, uh, I, I have it here. Uh, I, have, I have all my books here. Um, and, and I want to try to not just dwell on that book, but actually to um, talk some about the origins of haunting history, as well as the strategies I deploy in it. Uh, I'll then rehearse some of the main arguments. Uh, so those of you who have read it, you'll be sort of tracking with me uh, before briefly then turning to my most recent book, the one on Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, which, which is, in fact, an example uh, of this deconstructive approach to the past. So I, I actually deploy it. A and then I want to conclude by connecting haunting history to my current book project on, on what I call 
the surge. Uh, so, so hopefully it won't just remain in the past, but we'll actually bring bring the past up to the present and, and push toward the future. And this is the sort of uh, temporal anarchy, uh, which, which interests me at the moment. So, so to begin um, with sort of where haunting history came from, uh, well, I guess it came from, from two sources. One is this Levinas project, this book on Emmanuel Levinas, the, the Jewish Lithuanian philosopher who, who found his fame in, in France, uh, writing specifically on the concept of the other. Uh, I had been working on Levinas uh, in the Heidegger book. I had acquired an enormous amount of material that really wasn't part of that philosophical project, but was dealing actually with his interest in, in uh, questions of, you could call it theology, but it's really about transcendence. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out a way to write it. I, I tried using conventional techniques in intellectual history. Uh, I actually wrote a version and it just was completely inadequate to my mind because it, it didn't take up the topic uh, in the way that Levinas was trying to present it, it kept secularizing it and contextualizing it and holding it down uh, in, a, in one explanatory mode when there was this other explanatory mode that seemed to be necessary to be able to really get at what was happening in his thought. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But it was out of that frustration, me sort of giving up, that I started coming back to something I'd been working on for a long time uh, going back to when I was a student uh, of Jacques Derrida's um, in the 90s. Uh, and, and this was trying to apply deconstruction to history. Uh, and as I was working on this, I realized that historians, for the most part, uh, had decided this was impossible, that deconstruction and history were just two opposite things. The one would lead to relativism or sort of ceaseless unbuilding, while the other wants to construct a narrative and guide us on a path. Uh, and so then that led to another question as to why it was historians were so, uh, first at first I thought allergic, but then I realized they were scared uh, of deconstruction. Uh, and that's what led me to realize that there was something of a ghost or a geist uh, story going on here, uh, a geist in Geschichte in the sense of a ghost story and an intellectual history, but a question about uh, deconstruction uh, to the relation of history. Uh, now, this is the other side of uh, the, the origins uh, of haunting history, and that really has to do with my my. Uh, at the time, increasing frustration with the field, uh, increasing frustration with conventional history and uh, the limitations uh, of the field in regard to the application of theory uh, in ways that I found um, uh, to be very timid. Uh, and so the book Haunting History came out as kind of a quixotic endeavor, if you will, uh, tilting at windmills, but it really was an attempt to, to provoke uh, really a, a provocation or a polemic against the current state uh, of, the, of, of uh, uh, the historical discipline. Uh, and I'll talk about that. This is what I call ontological realism. And the opening of possibilities for other ways of imagining how uh, history might be written or really to move beyond history, the way we encounter the past. And one way this manifests in the book in Haunting History, which, which I won't talk about, but we, we could come to, has to do with the limitations of publishing, what I call the analog ceiling. And this is to say the ways that despite the digital world in which we live and the possibilities that have been revealed to us, we historians tend to still publish in a very conventional analog way as though the narrative strategy of the codex is the only way to do it. And so I really wanted to take issue with that and, and, and attack it uh, in various ways. And I do over the course of the book. Um, but this then leads me to uh, some of the strategies that I, uh, 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 I, I deploy uh, in haunting history. Um, the work, and I, I seem to be getting some feedback here from someone, but uh, as long as you all can hear me, that's fine. Let me know if that's the case. Um, the interdisciplinary nature uh, of the work I felt was essential because I wanted it to move beyond the confines uh, uh, of history uh, as a discipline. And so if you've seen the work, and if not, I'll sort of lay it out for you. Uh, it really dances uh, from 
history, to philosophy, to literature. You can see why Ranjan and I have such a, a, a tight connection because we're not staying in any one place. Uh, and in particular in this book, I was very um, uh, attuned to and interested in the importance of literature uh, for connecting with the past. And, and here you might see the influence of, of Hayden White. Uh, it really is my conviction and actually a, a talk I gave uh, at, at the book launch we had uh, at the University of North Bengal was precisely on this question of the ways uh, historians can use literature, not in an evidentiary sense, but actually literature tells us things about the past often that historians don't see or don't find. It, it does so in other ways. It precisely is a great way to get at these ghosts uh, that, that concern me. The hauntings, they appear. And so in the book, uh, the various uh, uh, works I use are ghost stories. I use Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, in particular, The Ghost of Christmas Present and The Ghost of Christmas Past. Uh, uh, one of the great things about The Ghost of Christmas Past in the book is the way Scrooge is always trying to put a big extinguisher cap on it so that, that the light doesn't uh, seem to spill out and get all over him. It's, uh, it, it's quite Freudian. I use uh, Washington Irving's Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which most people know is the story of the Headless Horseman. Uh, and there, of course, one of the things that fascinates me is precisely the, the, the horseman's lack of a head, our, our inability to know exactly who or what this horseman is. Uh, I, I refer to Kafka, Franz Kafka, and two stories there, his story of, of the Great Wall, where the gaps in the wall seem to be missing, and we're never quite sure whether those gaps were ever there. Uh, or whether uh, they've always been missing. And this is a kind of uh, metaphor for me as to the way, way history works. And uh, his other story, Abraham the Other, and then finally uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. And of course, the ghost of, of Hamlet is one that, that Derrida takes up, Inspector's Marks, and that connects these works. Um, literature, I would say, for me, is a great way to get skeptics, uh, realists, uh, those who uh, consider themselves to be entirely on the scientific side of things, to get them involved in the question of the ghost and of haunting. And this is because if you ask someone or present someone uh, with a ghost, uh, one of the first questions they'll always ask you is, well, do you really mean a ghost or do you mean a metaphor? Do you believe in ghosts? Are ghosts actually there? But when you use literature, when you use stories, uh, those, uh, there's a sort of suspension of disbelief. They're not troubled by the is it, isn't it question, and they're willing to go with you further. You can, you can almost seduce them uh, by bringing them into the ghost story and then taking that next step into the possibility of the ghost. Um, and for those of you who are curious, I, I, I do believe in ghosts I, as, as ghosts, but also as metaphor. And that's another aspect of the book that I really try to bring out and I continue to use. The, the metaphor is very important for me precisely because I see the metaphor as uh, permanently uh, interpretable. It's something that doesn't rest and can always be turned over again. And this, again, is a destabilization of the sorts of assumptions that, that historical narratives should be, should be permanent and in place for all time. Uh, this then opens up other possibilities like historical analogy without it becoming too fraught or tense. And then this other aspect, which is what I call temporal anarchy. And I'll, I'll try to come to that or at least point toward it at the end. But this is a, a, a time without ruler, a time without rule. That's anarchos here. But, but let me turn to the major premise of haunting history, which uh, quite simply if I could call it that, is that the past, uh, like a ghost, is by definition absent and thus has no ontological, ontological properties per se. Or at best, we could perhaps say it has a latent ontology. History, to my mind, is the presence of absence. And what we do have of it is that which presents itself to us or what we force upon it. But as with the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow, crucial aspects of the past are missing. They lie hidden, buried, forgotten, or lost. And these are the latent possibles that we might encounter while searching for something else, or that it could any moment break loose and come hurling at us seemingly out of nowhere, as did the horseman's head striking Ichabod Crane. 
To push this further, I want to note that the future, too, is decidedly altered by these visitors from the past, these revenants or arrivants. But if we're to consider the past as akin to the ghost and history as a hauntological endeavor, or as holding a latent ontology if you're too squeamish for ontology, then it's worth asking what it is that troubles us about the ghost. In Spectres of Marx, Derrida asks the question, what is the ghost? What is the effectivity or the presence of the specter? That is, of what seems to remain as ineffective, virtual, insubstantial, uh, a simulacrum. Well, the ghost or specter is troubling precisely because it is the past come again, but emptied of its physical properties and disobedient to the rules of time and space. Uh, the ghost is, to my mind, a temporal anarchist. Derrida says one cannot control its coming and its goings because it begins by coming back. So what's troubling and powerful about the ghost is not that it is present, which it is in a way, but the ways that its presence disturbs all the spatio-temporal categories by which we have come to make sense of the world around us. The ghost troubles both time and space, and thus, one cannot make sense of it. For Derrida, the porous and disturbing nature of the past that haunts us provokes us to question the historical ground on which we stand and the borders by which we divide past, present, and future. We cannot actually say what the ghost means. Like the past, it has no ontological properties, but nonetheless, it is. And here I'll I'll show you what kind of is I mean, one that's, that's crossed out, and I'll, I'll return to this. So following Derrida, I characterize the majority of conventional history, historians as attempting to ontologize remains, to make them present in the first place by identifying the bodily remains, and then by localizing the dead in an effort to tame this haunting past. And this is the approach uh, to the past that I call ontological realism. And what I mean by this, by ontological realism, is a commitment to history as an endeavor concerned with events that are assigned to a specific location in space and time, and as such are in principle observable, and as such are regarded as fixed and immutable. So on this reading, there are no ghosts. It's all retrievable. On a, well, like you could uh, pick up this bottle, you could pick up the past. No headless horseman, no Hamlet's father, no ghost of Christmas past, no hauntology, just the facts. Now, most conventional historians are in this sense ontological realists in their research, writing, and teaching, even if they also claim to be epistemic skeptics, epistemic relativists, or even if they feel there's a great deal of hermeneutic entanglement between the historian and the past. But as the philosopher Louis Mink observed in his piece on the writing and rewriting of history from 1972, such a belief, and here I quote Mink, in the actuality and immutability of the past is based on a cluster of unconscious and invalid analogies, end quote. So for Mink, these include such analogies as uh, between temporal distance and spatial distance, between memory and perception, or between a past present and a present past. To these, I would add the faulty analogy between the formal narrative presentation of a past as it happened and the ontological reality of that past. According to Mink, the ability to hold these analogies is indicative of the incompatible views we hold about the reality of the past about the relation of historical knowledge to its object, whatever that be, and about the relevance of historical knowledge to the possibilities of action which lie before us. So Mink sums up this paradox by articulating the way historians hold the simultaneous view that everything which belonged to the action when it was taking place in its own present belongs to it now that it's past, alongside the conflicting realization that the past isn't there at all. Mink sees this paradox as the motivating force behind all serious philosophy of history. I see it as proximate to what I refer to as the latent ontology or hauntology of a past that is and isn't. And 
I would say one of the most salient values of this deconstructive approach to history is that it draws attention to the ways historians often maintain the teleological power of a principle whose possibility they actually refuse. If I can modify a passage from Derrida's Freud and the Scene of Writing, this ontological realist position is dangerous, not because it refers to writing, because, but because it presupposes that the past exists as a text, which would simply already be there, immobile. Like the serene presence of a statue, of a written stone or archive whose significant content might be harmlessly transported into the milieu of a different language or time. The danger lies in the assumption that there is an unerasable and indelible trace left in the past by which the ontological reality of the past can be determined. But an unerasable trace is not a trace. It's a full presence, an immobile and incorruptible substance. Derrida calls it a son of God, a sign of parousia, not a seed. That is, it's not a mortal germ. The stability afforded to identity is not the property of a mortal being who exists in and through the indeterminacy of time. Such a fixed, immutable quality belongs to a god or to the dead. And here I think we gain purchase on the force and seduction of ontological realism. Indeed, I would say that it is the meaning we don't or can't find in the present that ontological realists construct in the past. So it's my conviction that the past is a site of spectrality, of ghosts and hauntings, such that in haunting history, I argue that the past is both a presence and an absence, as I said. It's a specter or ghost that haunts our present. To quote that work, the past is and is not, or better yet, it is. <laughs> the past comes and goes, and the pieces we do have are shot through with the non-synchronicity of prior historical tellings. For this reason, I think it's more accurate to think of the past not in terms of ontology, because strictly speaking, it has none, but as hauntology. Now, hauntology is a Derridian term that relies on the sonic affinity between ontology and hauntology that the concept of hauntology haunts by replacing. So when spoken in French, ontology and ontology are indistinguishable, perhaps not with my accent, but you get what I mean. History, too, is a replacing of this sort, where the past event or figure is silently determined by the telling which replaces it. But the telling in the present is haunted by the ghost of the absent past, which is neither present nor absent, neither here nor gone. This disjunction or disruption at the core of history exposes the ways that origins and grounds are always posited so as to determine the beginning from the point of view of the end, thus smuggling both the teleology and rigidity into the account. Conventional historians give the past event the ontological reality of a fixed and permanent object, silently replacing the spectral status with a fleshly one. But the ontological properties of the past event are constructed by the historian in the present. What's more, my argument about the past doubles as an ontological questioning of the present. If the past is, in this crossed out way, what kind of present can now be reconceived? The present does not exist as a direct extension of the past, just as historical inquiry cannot treat the past as ontologically given. In returning to the present, inquiry must approach the present and the intervention it seeks to make in the present, first of all, as a performative interpretation, an interpretation that transforms and even hijacks the past for which it provides an account. To follow the analysis of Stefanos Yerolanos, the problem is that the present historians imagine is itself anachronistic. The fiction of a stable past is the fiction of a stable present. But such a stable narrative cannot account for the hauntological nature of the past or the ways that past possibles condition our possible pasts. So what I mean by this turn 
is that our knowledge of the past is conditioned by what presents itself to us, both in terms of its remains and in terms of our reception. The limits of what we are willing to accept as past possibles conditions what we are willing to accept as possible pasts. That which lies beyond this realm appears to us as simply impossible, like a ghost. But the ghost is only impossible insofar as it is a remainder of a different time and place, and its untimely presence disturbs us. The latent past is not the impossible. It was possible, and it did happen, though perhaps it has been rendered inconceivable or unimaginable, and thus exiled by beyond the realm of what now appears as possible. It's when what lies latent appears, returns, that history is haunted, and we are confronted with the possibility that our understanding of the past is only partial, and often willfully so. This partial past is one possible past, to be sure, but one that does not account or budget for a host of other possible pasts and past possibles. These have been suppressed, effaced, lost, or forgotten, and these are the ghosts and specters that haunt us in the present. If we think of the history of Sleepy Hollow in Washington Irving's book, it's not only a story of charming, rustic settlers in New England, prone to tales of the supernatural, but it's also and importantly a story about the violent dispossession of indigenous Native Americans. When what is latent of the past becomes manifest, it opens new historical possibilities. Of course, these remnants of the past are only new in the sense that they can now appear within the realm of the possible as a possible past, thus altering history itself. So this is all to say, there is no past to be recovered in the form of the realist narrative or as a determinant object of history because that's not the structure of the past. This is neither the ontology nor the reality of the past, and thus I think there is much to be gleaned in thinking of the past itself as blinking in and out of our existence, like a twinkle light, uh, a statement that's gotten me into quite a bit of trouble and one we can talk about in the question and answer. The conjuring trick of ontological realism is that it allows the historian to exert his or her own influence over the past by restricting and concealing the past possibles that expose other possible pasts. And this is akin to the way that Scrooge in The Christmas Carol presses that extinguisher cap down on the ghost of Christmas past. And to quote from Dickens, Though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. And one might think of those past possibles, those hauntings streaming in, pushing, surging forth to us, uh, no matter how much we try to hold them down. You cannot kill a ghost. The past continues to haunt history. Derrida links the ghost to the trace and to difference, thus challenging notions of absolute priority or absolute foundations. I like dif link difference to the project of history. Derrida writes, quote, if the word history did not in and of itself convey the motif of a final repression of difference, one could say that only differences can be historical from the outset and in each of their aspects, end quote. History, as conventionally conceived, is precisely the repression of differences in an attempt to generate a singular, intelligible narrative that necessarily overwrites those aspects that confuse, confound, or contradict that narrative. Derrida presents difference as the counter to this repression, offering instead, and here I quote him, the playing moment that produces these differences, these effects of difference, end quote. Thus, what I'm suggesting is that we imagine doing history with difference in mind, crafting the playing moment that produces these effects of difference. In a later article, I talk about it as an alienation effect, one that leads us to realize that there might be something to question or wonder to understand the grounds upon which historical narratives are built. To be sure, the purpose of history is to make the past legible and intelligible to offer a poros, 
a pathway through the chaotic aporia of the past. And insofar as history serves to make the past legible in the present, it should be seen as a writing whose function is to make present what is absent to render legible that which would otherwise be illegible, seen what otherwise would be unseen. But as such, it is, and here I quote Derrida again, a mark that subsists, one which does not exhaust itself in the moment of its inscription, and which can give rise to an iteration in the absence and beyond the presence of the empirically determined subject who, in a given context, has emitted or produced it, end quote. Thus, even the most methodologically sound and precise historical investigation is not only a necessarily partial investigation bound by the epistemological horizon of the historian's own time and place, but it also carries within it a force that breaks with its context, that is, with the collectivity of presences organizing the moment of its inscription. This is partly because the historical work is itself haunted by the past it cannot contain, but also because future historians can perhaps come to recognize other possibilities in the historical work by inscribing or grafting it onto other chains. The force of this rupture means that history can never rest in peace, but the rupture can also be seen as an incision, that is, uh, the emergence of a mark that serves to make visible the various directions of space, providing orientation in an expanse previously devoid of any la landmarks. It's, it's like a scar. This follows one sense that Derrida ascribes to the verb diffare as, quote, temporalization and spacing, the becoming time of space and the becoming space of time, the originary constitution of time and space, end quote. Now, this is a key aspect of the historical endeavor that seeks to situate past events in a specific time and place as best as one can based on the sources and evidence. In doing so, the historian posits the coordinates of time and space through periodization or geographical demarcation. But lest the poros become the aporia, we must recognize that the emergence of this mark and here I quote Derrida again, derives from no category of being, whether present or absent. For what is put into question is precisely the quest for a rightful beginning, an absolute point of departure, a principal responsibility, end quote. And this is where in uh, Haunting History, I, I refer to the philosopher Sarah Kaufman. Uh, and Kaufman says, quote, when one speaks of a poros or a path, uh, they speak of it when it's a matter of blazing a trail where no trail exists or could exist, properly speaking, of crossing what is impassable, an apparon, which it is impossible to cross from end to end, end quote. The poros and aporia are necessarily linked, and this is the nature of the trail that the historian seeks to forge from a position in the present to the event in the past. But Kaufman also reminds us that the term, and here I quote her, poros, should not be confused with odos. And odos, of course, is where we get methodology. It should not be confused with odos, which is a general term that designates any sort of road or path. Poros refers solely to a sea or river route, to a passage that is opened across a chaotic expanse and which transforms it into an ordered and qualified space by introducing differentiated routes, making visible various directions of space, providing orientation in an expanse previously devoid of any landmarks, end quote. So I see this as a particularly apt metaphor, both for the past and the endeavor of the historian who aspires to chart a route or passage over an unruly and at times indistinguishable expanse that churns beneath his or her endeavors. Indeed, most of the past recedes into the ocean, leaving no discernible trace, like the wake of a passing ship or an item lost overboard. It simply dissipates or sinks to the depths of the sea. Now, if one comes along in a short enough time, uh, one could follow the wake of a ship passing before us, or one that came soon after retracing their route, even as evidence of these prior ships dissipate. 
Then again, at any given moment, a sudden surge could bring evidence of past remains to the surface, even as it disturbs or destroys the wakes that previously served as marks for orientation. And I'll return to this surge at the end of my talk. More often, the historian works from a greater temporal distance, relying partly on materials still immediately present, hailing from times which we are seeking to understand, like remains, partly whatever ideas human beings have obtained and transmitted to be remembered, and we would call these sources, partly things wherein both these forms of materials are combined, like monuments. And these are all, these three categories are taken from, from uh, uh, Johann Droysen. Now, we could think of these monuments, sources, remains, and such as sea charts, buoys, shipwrecks, or reefs that serve as the basis for navigation, uh, though the sources themselves may very well be the wakes of past ships. And Derrida does remind us and ask us whether anyone ever thought that we've been tracking down something other than tracks themselves to be tracked down. Tracks of tracks of tracks. The past itself is the most mobile, changeable, and polymorphous of all spaces, a space where any path that has been traced can be obliterated and such is analogous to Hesiod's Tartarus, that is the image of chaos itself. The chaotic and polymorphous nature of the past provokes anxiety, fear, and in response to such chaos, we seek an ordered way out. But here we must pay close attention to the way that the paths historians construct to bring order and intelligibility to the chaotic expanse that is the past can themselves become impasses when a historical narrative precludes other possible voices, vantages, or viewpoints. What I mean by this is that the pathway forged as, a, as an escape itself becomes a trap when you're restricted from straying off this straight and narrow uh, ordained route from one point to another. You won't go looking out there in the vast expanse for the other evidences, the other possible throughways from the past to the present. You'll stay on that, that one now trapping path. The poros in this way becomes an aporia, restricting us from accessing other possible paths and truly limiting what we can imagine. So here is where I wish to modify a passage by Derrida to make the link between difference and history explicit. In the project of history, one can expose only that of the past which, uh, at a certain moment, can become present, manifest, that which can be shown, presented as something present, uh, a being present in its truth, in the truth of a present or the presence of the present. Now, if the past is, in this uh, uh, struck-out way, and I, I place a bar across the is, both striking it out and indicating an obstruction that restricts all access, if the past is what makes possible the presentation of the being present of history, it is never presented as such. The past itself is never offered to the present. With acknowledgement to the way this modifies Derrida's argument, by following this move, I see history as linked to difference because of the latent ontology of the past. The past as history is crossed out, present and absent. And I have to say that I've replaced the X strike through offered by Derrida with the bar strike through to demonstrate the present absent nature of the past event, but also the ways that we are barred, barré, we're barred from actually having that past event as such in the present. In this way, the bar indicates and makes explicit the ontological epistemological entanglement of history and the historian with the past. The historian is concerned with the traces of the past that we have at hand, but our object of inquiry, if we can call it an object at all, has no ontological properties of its own in the present and is conjured by the medium of the historian, often entangling the categories of legend and fact, fact and fiction, now and then. A deconstructive approach to the past linked to difference as this sort of crafting and playing moment, it produces effects of difference, and it unhinges history from the as-it-really-happened 
of ontological realism, problematizing the belief in a fixed and stable past, which, as I said, is the myth of a fixed and stable present. Now, the emphasis on play is in tension with a conventional approach to history that emphasizes presence because, here I quote Derrida, play is always play of absence and presence. But if it is to be thought radically, play must be conceived of before the alternative of presence and absence, prior to it. So this is an approach that recognizes and embraces both the past that is and the importance of the imagination required to think radically. This concept, the past that is, marks an irreducible and generative multiplicity. The supplement and turbulence of a certain lack fracture the limit of the text, forbidding an exhaustive reading of it. Now, far from implying the death or abdication of the author, deconstruction for the writing of history, history requires a strong and careful historian or author, a scholar, whose rhetorical style guides the reader along the poros that simultaneously introduces and acknowledges the aporia it creates. So in this way, it provides a pathway to the past that activates the latent ontology, making it present, but without privileging that presence in the way that the ontological realist narrative does. In doing so, this approach inhabits and appropriates the methodological and evidentiary commitments of traditional historical work, but it does so in a way that makes evident and legible the limits and barriers of conventional historical method. Uh, I would say fears that a deconstructive approach will inevitably lead to relativism are unwarranted because the very methods of the historical discipline are concerned. And to quote Derrida again, the movements of deconstruction do not shake up solicite, they do not shake up structures from the outside. They're not possible and effective. They do not focus their strikes except by inhabiting these structures. Inhabiting them in a particular way because one always habits, inhabits, and all the more so when one does not suspect it. Operating necessarily from the inside, borrowing from the old structure, the strategic and economic resources of subversion, borrowing them structurally, that is to say without being able to isolate their elements and atoms, the enterprise of deconstruction is always, in a certain way, swept away by its own work, end quote. I advocate working from the inside to expose the limitations and restrictions of the historical practice. Such an approach works within the historical tradition to destabilize that tradition, and as such is always cognizant of the past as aporia, and actively works to shake the ground it has laid. So this is done, or could be done, <clears throat> by what Derrida has called a double gesture, un double geste, or a double session, la double séance, wherein we first overturn the traditional concept of history, but at the same time mark the interval and take care by virtue of the overturning and by the simple act of conceptualiz conceptualization that this interval not be reappropriated. We don't want to invert the hierarchy to conserve the hierarchy. We want to expose uh, the, the instability of play. So here the possible past that one recounts cannot preclude other past possibles and thus necessarily remains open to other and alternative pasts. In this way, we proceed using a double gesture, according to a unity that is both systematic and in and of itself divided, a double writing, that is, a writing that is in and of itself multiple. So this is, in fact, what I've done in my most recent book. Uh, so I'd like to briefly rehearse the argument in the form of the book as a concrete example of the approach uh, for which I'm advocating. So in this book, Emmanuel Levinas's Talmudic Turn, I employ a distinction between uh, what Levinas refers to as God on our side and God on God's side, which he takes from the 18th century rabbi and Talmudist, Rabbi Chaim of Belosian. I bet you wouldn't think he'd be discussing Talmud today, but, but here it comes. Well, a sliver. Well, this allows me to provide two discrete and at times conflicting approaches to Levinas's Talmudic readings. So in my book, each chapter is written, I don't know if you can see this, it's not a great 
you can kind of see the double column. Uh, it's written using a two-column format, a double séance, wherein one narrative is historically situated and argued from our side uh, using uh, secular conventions, while the other narrative uses Levinas's Talmudic readings, these sacred texts, uh, to approach the issue as timeless and derived from God on God's side. So the first presents a more or less uh, traditional intellectual history of Levinas's Talmudic lectures that provides a contextual reading of the sources and causes for his turn to Talmud, as well as a critical assessment of how his interpretive strategies are at times in conflict with his stated ethical commitment to the other. But the second, the second column simultaneously offers a counter that allows for Levinas's transcendent claims about the past, history, and the ethical opening to the other to stand in opposition to those of the first. Each session is meant to be in dialogue and conflict with the other, such that the claims made in each session on the Talmudic lectures are often in direct conflict with the historical explanations offered as intellectual history. The one is historically situated and argued from our side, while the other approaches the issue as timeless, derived from God on God's own side, even if the lessons to be learned can and should be applied to specific moments in time. So this means that it's also the case that Levinas's Talmudic readings presented in the book should be seen as applicable to our moment today. The architecture and presentation of this book is structured to facilitate this strategy, this deconstructive approach to the past. And as noted, the column on the left provides the intellectual history of Levinas's Talmudic lectures, while the column on the right takes up single Talmudic lectures from this other side. Now, the two-column approach allows for the two historical registers to unsettle each other, such that every reader is forced to consider the underlying logic or assumptions that ground each interpretive strategy. As you can glean, this ties my Levinas manuscript to haunting history, insofar as the two-column approach enacts the unsettling of singular historical accounts and or the positing of a singular historical origin. And in this way, the Levinas book forms uh, really the second part of what will be a trilogy, beginning with haunting history, followed uh, by the Levinas book and completed with the surge. One important template for this strategy is the double séance as presented by Derrida in his work Gla or his essay Timpan in Martin's Philosophy. But the more immediate and relevant template is the Talmud itself, uh, wherein multiple and often conflicting commentaries and interpretations compete upon a single page. And for those of you who don't know, and uh, many don't, the Talmud is a sacred Jewish text composed of two different elements, uh, Mishnah and Gemara. The Mishnah is the written collection of the Jewish oral tradition known as the Oral Torah. Uh, and that was compiled in Palestine around 200 CE. The Gemara is composed of rabbinic commentaries on the Mishnah that were themselves redacted and compiled. Now, these were these two different conflicting uh, interpretive strategies can serve not only the ones that deem, they deem to be uh, correct or valid, but also the ones uh, that are dismissed so that all of the text is maintained uh, and you end up with these conflicting and baffling often uh, discussions. But they all center around uh, what one would might call the Old Testament or the books of Moses. Uh, and this is the Ur text around which that work is constructed. So a crucial distinction uh, between my work and Talmud, or perhaps even uh, Derrida, is that in Levinas book, there is no authoritative text around which my commentary, my two columns are organized. The master or ur text is absent. And this too coincides with the arguments of haunting history, which questions the authority and permanence of anything like an absolute original. To my mind, the past about which we write history is just such an absent text. So this does place an interpretive burden on the reader, but it does so by design, so as not to overdetermine the reader's conclusions. The two competing columns of text are designed to inform, challenge, and drive the reader forward. It is also playful, and that's the difference, that, that playful engagement. It encourages the reader to play with the text, 
by choosing their path through it. You could read intellectual history first, then Talmud, Talmud first, all of one, all of the other. Uh, it's written so the reader trained to read texts from left to right will take the intellectual history to be the first session, while the reader trained to read right to left will take the Talmudic lessons to be the first session. This deconstructive approach forces the author and reader to interrogate the ways that particular interpretive approaches serve to close off other possible paths and to instead write or construct history in a way so as to destabilize the authority of any one possible past, thus leaving the past in a certain sense open. This makes clear the necessity of an interminable analysis wherein the historical investigation turns on itself as the hierarchy is constantly reestablished, each undermining the definitive status of the other. I would say that history as ontology is especially warranted when dealing with actors or events traditionally rendered outside of the realm of conventional history to make what was absent present and what was illegible legible. Recent attention to world or global history has shifted the historical gaze to non-European or non-Western regions, uh, and this is surely a laudable and important development, but it is for the most part done so by employing conventional Western epistemological and methodological historical conventions and approaches. In this way, the Western understanding of history is implicitly considered a norm against which all understandings and logics of the past or of history must measure up or be discounted. The result is certainly a more expansive geographic understanding, but it's an equally restrictive and Eurocentric understanding of the past and history. One might go so far as to say it's a sort of historical imperialism. The deconstructive approach could employ these conventional Western historical strategies in one session, but place them in tension, uh, even in conflict with different vernacular or regional understandings of history in the past. Uh, and this would then place this uh, dominant approach to disciplinary history in question. One could imagine the history of Nepal that looks to conventional historiography, but also to Nepalese chronicles taken on their own terms. To be sure, the latent ontology of the past is bound and constrained by our imagination in the present, by that which we can imagine as having been possible. Nevertheless, the latent and missing portions of the past haunt us, and though many conventional historians might seek to press them down like an extinguisher cap upon a flame, or outrun them, as Ichabod Crane did, the headless horseman, it's simply folly to think that the past is merely what we tell it to be. Instead, I argue historians should try to enact a historical methodology or approach that is commensurate, if never adequate, to the past that is. So in Haunting History, I conclude that book by gesturing toward the inevitable return or resurfacing of that which is latent the missing portions of the past that haunt history and that come hurling at us like the severed head of a Hessian horseman. But in my current work, the final part of this trilogy, The Surge, I seek to expand and build on this phenomenon. So earlier on in Haunting History, I describe how at any given moment, a sudden surge can bring evidence of past remains to the surface. And I use the metaphor of the ocean, as you recall, as the site of this surge. Now, one could also imagine a surge of wind, of power, of sound, and certainly recent films uh, involving the supernatural, uh, or ghosts, or haunting spirits, malevolent or misunderstood, often signal the arrival of this present absence with a surge of electricity overtaxing the lights, or by a surge of sound, sometimes even blowing the lights up, leaving us in darkness, or reaching a deafening crescendo, leaving us in total silence. Uh, we are, by and large, afraid of surges, and, as I've suggested, we are equally afraid of the past. That is, at least, part of the argument in haunting history. The instability of such open possibilities is disturbing. You'll have to excuse me. Oh, I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with this. 
There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. But that's the unexpected, right? It arrives. The instability of such open possibilities is disturbing, and conventional history often serves as an, as an anesthetic that desensitizes us to its jarring effects. As such, conventional history does not leave the past in its otherness, but always includes it in a whole, calling this a uh, historical perspective. So this can take the form of a theological imperative or a secular one, as uh, we see in the Levinas book. Uh, but all of them are about controlling the past and limiting the surge, even if the goal of such protections uh, can be laudable. But as in haunting history, uh, and in this talk where I demonstrate the ways that the noble goal of forging a path to the past, the poro simultaneously creates an aporia, the singular nature of the explanatory model as the arbiter of meaning restricts our gaze and our attunement to the possible paths and past possibles which are surging forth to meet us. And it's to these surges of the past, to these ghosts, that I believe we should be attuned. These are the histories that need to be heard, not in the purged, restricted, and methodologically homogenous version demanded by conventional history, but as histories that open space for multiple and conflicting logics of how we encounter, account for, and recount the past. What I call the surge is the unfettered intermingling of past, present, and future. It is free, it is generous, but it is also dangerous. The approach to the past, I propose, is something like a surge detector that seeks the sites of political and ethical intervention and such engages in a plural logic of history and a different mode of argumentation. It accepts multiple logics of history and temporality. The anachrony of the surge, this unrestrained mingling of past, present, and future, is disorienting compared to the ordered and ordering temporality of conventional history. But just as the magnetic poles of our planet have shifted, rendering a traditional compass misaligned, our old modes of history no longer guide us. Instead, I think we need a new compass of history that is not restrained by what has been or where we have been told to go, but is instead attracted to what can be, thus pointing us toward critical political and ethical action. In this way, I'm turning from the descriptive analysis of haunting history to a prescriptive philosophy of history. Now, a key question is how one pursues criticism and ethics without a normative definition of the two or having to resort to the concept of regulative ideas and ideals. So I'm sufficiently constructivist and Nietzschean to operate with an unbound and historically contingent understanding of ethics and ethical action. Then again, I'm trying to think through the ways that the surge either brings the past to us or helps us rise up to meet it in ways that make for ethical and political commitments in our present and for the future. So on this understanding, there is no one def normative uh, definition or regulative guideline. Thus, there is the very real potential that the ethical or political intervention which prevails in the end may not be the one which you or I would hope for. This is the danger. But is that not the case now? And would it not be better to confront this instability and this danger on the front end instead of throwing up our hands afterwards and saying, why don't you believe what I think is true? I would like for us to imagine the project of history as a response to the surge. And this will be, and here I offer another modification of Derrida from Spectres of Marx, a matter of thinking with a new logic of history, not another history or a new historicism, but another opening of eventness as historicity that permits one not to renounce, but on the contrary, to open up access to an affirmative thinking of the past as multiple and polysemic. History as an opening to the other, be they past, present, or future, and not as a definitive cipher or design. The key to fulfilling the promise resides in the opening of access to other events in the past as history, 
and other openings of eventness as historicity. The temporal anarchy of this fulfillment is that it must sustain itself as a continuous act, which paradoxically can never truly be fulfilled. By attuning ourselves to the surge and to these ghosts, to the way they tear at conventional understandings of time and temporality, historians can take up their cause, which is also our own. I take this to be an attunement to the past that allows such an historian or thinker to hear the call of the absent, missing, or hidden dead. In this way, the dead are not taken as persons or commodities no longer present whose properties and scope have been previously determined. That would be the ontological realist way. The past is not an object which can simply be retrieved. Instead, the historian listens to the dead that haunt us as the presence of an absence out of time, which is as of yet unknown and undetermined. This allows or opens space for multiple and conflicting logics of how we encounter, account for, and recount the past. The actors and vocabularies may be unorthodox, or the accounts may be poetic, but these myriad approaches and definitions of history force us to question the dominance, politics, and ideologies behind any one variant. To return to the ocean metaphor, we must learn to surf the surge, to ride with a history of differing logics and approaches to the past, rather than battle against it and them by opposing methodological uniformity applied to an ever-increasing field of areas and subjects. I see this imperative for history and for education now, because this attunement to the otherwise of the past is likewise an attunement to the other in our present. As such, the past provides the call for a moral imperative in the present and for the future. The radical or total other of the surge humbles us in a way and prepares us for the proximate other, be they an actor from another time or another culture or simply another place. Attunement to the surge imbues one with the potential to transform one's present, but only if the particular event surging from the past, now as history, is not left in the past, as though the danger is over and done with, or entirely appropriated by the present, telling it what we want it to be. The French philosopher Vladimir Yankelevich once warned of the ever-persistent march of time that inevitably leads to forgetting. And with that forgetfulness, a washing away of past wrongs. The historian's calling has long been to battle against this river of Lethe. But perhaps more pernicious is the way that the historical focus on evils and wrongs of the past allows us to ignore or demote the evils and wrongs in our present. This is what Berber Bevernage has called temporal Manichaeism. Attunement to the surge is an attunement to the past in the present that allows each to travel through the other. The evils of the past cannot be left in the past, but neither can they be co-opted by my present in the form of a select group or individual. The work of research and teaching the work of history should not be the work of listening to ourselves, our own laments or triumphs, but listening to the ghosts, hearing the ghost, hearing the past, attunement to the other coming from a different temporal direction. Our approach to history must be a tool that punctures time. Could one address in general, Derrida asks, if already some ghost did not come back? If one loves justice, at least, the scholar of the future the intellectual of tomorrow should learn it and learn it from the ghost. Historians of the future of tomorrow need to learn how to let the ghost speak and how to let the past speak rather than speaking for them or for it. So let's link this back to haunting history. The approach, the approach to the past for which I'm advocating is one that is haunted by its lack of a de definitive origin or ground and guided or pushed by the surge. The former claim is not out of line with what many teachers and researchers actually do when they write or teach history because this haunting calls for a constant questioning of origins and sources. What's more, 
it takes a step beyond conventional perspectivalism in which, yes, each viewpoint is considered equally valid, but all such viewpoints run on the same and singular logic of what is allowed to count as history. This is what one could call a correspondent logic of history, where the past event and the historical account must have a one-to-one correspondence. This means that either there is only one correct account, or all accounts are equally correct, leading to relativism and ultimately our current climate of post-truth. Instead, I'm asking us to consider the possibility of multiple logics, to take each seriously and to place these differing logics in conversation and even, yes, in conflict with each other. Not to reach a homogenous conclusion, but to help us better understand the possibility of differing epistemologies or ways of ordering the world. This has benefits both temporally, investigating the past, and geographically, encountering other cultures on grounds that are not one's own. I see the surge as the means of taking up this understanding of history as emerging and temporally dynamic, not static, not frozen. Related to this temporal shift is an emphasis on the universality of history, a reclaiming of a universality of history, the story for a future humanity and a future beyond humanity, which eclipses the particularity of any past event. This is not an understanding of the past in a possessive form, a restrictive my or ours, but instead a universal they, of which we are and are not a part. This is to say the past event can only serve us if we look beyond its particularity as past and toward its guidance toward their future, of which we are and are not a part. This is a conjuring of past, present, and future, Uh, that is an exorcism of sorts. An exorcism not in order to chase away the ghosts, uh, but this time to grant them rights. If it means making them come back alive as revenant who would no longer be revenant, but as other arrivant to whom a hospitable memory or promise must offer welcome, without certainty ever that they present themselves as such. This, of course, is a Derridian construct. In welcoming these ghosts, not as remnants of the past, but as the site of engagement and listening, we intermingle past and present. And this, I would say, is a haunting history leading toward what can be rather than what has already passed. A haunting history not engaged only with the deconstructive approach to the past, but an attempt to entangle the past with the present leading us toward the future. Thank you very much. Yes, Ethan, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for this wonderful presentation. But yes, I can tell you something as the chat box shows up that lots of people are haunted by your talk. <laughs> and uh, since it's late evening in India, so it's very much expected that all the ghosts are out. And the way <laughs> that you invoked the ghosts for the last one hour, it seems that uh, you have really have to put up with a lot of haunted hearts and minds here because I can see uh, lots of questions there on the chat box so you can pick as you wish and go on responding to them okay well yeah. let me let me try to, to see uh, do you want me to read the questions out or do you want to read the questions well I, I could I could probably look at them and and, yeah, yeah. and do so uh, and I guess I'll just sort of uh, uh, move along um, you'll, you'll uh, forgive the quick as well as you can see that yeah yes uh So one question about whether the institutional instructions uh, with the wherewithal to modulate the past and already anticipate or foreshadow the more or less radical aspects of the absent past. I'm thinking of sponsored teaching here. So so that's a good question. Of course, that's a, a question about um, the institutional restrictions that, that attempt to discipline us. Um, and this is, um, of course, a... a, a, a a question that is very difficult and, and sort of points 
uh, in some ways to a matter of privilege and, and I would say to my to my own privilege and being able to, to to make certain statements because of where I am in the university that that I certainly was uh, more shy to make when I was a, an, an untenured professor um, uh, it, it's very difficult to find those seams of sponsored research that allow one to truly uh, make radical claims uh, because oftentimes they are trying to work with established modes of power. Uh, and this uh, is always a sort of a, a delicate balance. Now, I would say the, 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 the positive or the affirmative, the place where sponsored research uh, can be used is precisely if one is able to work within those seams of power, of inserting oneself, inhabiting is the term I use. Uh, and in the inhabiting is where you can kind of get the ghosts to come up. Uh, but it's always a, it's a dance. It's a dance because it, uh, the, the disciplining is an attempt to force one onto a poros, to make one follow a certain path. You know, uh, meta-odos, methodology, this uh, is all about the mastering of one way. Uh, and so it, it becomes very difficult uh, to, to, to work against them. Nevertheless, I would certainly say that the, the, the trick is in the inhabiting, to letting the ghosts out. That's where the radicality lies. Um, Let's see. Let's talk about the crossed out here. Uh, more than once in your lecture, uh, relational writing of Heidegger's notion of crossed out being. Yes, well done. Uh, Heidegger's work have any relevance to your thoughts on ontological history of CS? How would that be relevant when the political implications of the past possibles or possibles when they make their ghost-like appearances in the present? Those are two great questions. So, yes, Heidegger, of course, haunts me. Uh, Heidegger haunts uh, Derrida. Heidegger haunts Levinas as well. Um, this crossed out notion of being, of course, is in Heidegger becomes a forgetting of being or and there's sort of an ecstatic way in which being gets outside of, of one. Uh, and that's certainly important. I'm probably more interested in the being in time moment of Heidegger, where uh, the way the, the way we construct ourselves as historical creatures uh, gives us the possibilities that we take forward. And of course, this works in both a limiting and a liberating way. And I'm interested in, in trying to crack open the liberating side. So this would be a kind of authentic, authenticity that is unchained to the, the, the individual, as is the case in being in time. And that's where the crossed out being, the crossed out sense of being, like, especially in the later Heidegger, would, would come into play because there's something ecstatic. There's something outside that we're gesturing toward. Uh, and this is what Levinas really does, is he says it's, it's not in this ego, not in the da Dasein, but actually... Uh, in the opening to the other where one finds that the alterity. Uh, so uh, in the, in the cross out, of course, it, it, there's resonances of Heidegger, but uh, I guess I too would be trying to, to overcome a certain metaphysics in doing so. Now, as to the political implications of the past possible as a possible past, I think that's, that's absolutely right. The, the, the point is, is that it's always the case that those, uh, 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 past possibles that are rendered outside of what's allowed are done so for political or ideological reasons. Um, we understand what we accept as possible historical circumstances because of the ideological need to construct narratives uh, that uh, work uh, with a certain government or certain notion of state or nation. And in particular here, we would think about the way that the historical discipline in its current form is a derivative of a 19th century version uh, obsessed uh, with with the nation and the nation as the 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 the, the raison d'etre of his store of his historical work and so the idea is precisely to allow these other possible narratives these other possible tellings to have space to knock us off to destabilize uh, the more ideological variants and so um, I do think it's it, it is a, a necessarily political gesture um, and uh, potentially a radical one, though not uh, necessarily. Um, okay. Uh, so ghosts as ghosts and ghosts as metaphor. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, an abject identity to an individual perceived as a threat to our sense of order and stability. Next, what do you think about the uh, writing history? Uh, well, we lost the last part of it. So oh, I could talk about the ghosts. I mean, so yeah, the, the ghost works as an excellent metaphor and can be grafted onto things to sort of 
uh, actually uh, uh, demote them from a sense of solidity into a sense of spectrality or ephemerality. And I think it works very well there. But, but even perhaps more important is I think the ghost is frightening to us, but one of the things I'm trying to lead us toward, and certainly this is the, the, the last part of the talk, is the ways that the ghost actually can, can, can be a, a, wel- a possibility of welcome and not a possibility of fear. Uh, it does seem to strike fear in us because of our lack of control or power. And that may be a possibility for us to think of other ways of conceiving the world around us, not just the past, but the world in which we live. Um, in this way, I would say that it doesn't have to necessarily be a threat. It is a threat to our sense of order, but that may not be a problem. That actually may be a way of telling us we need to let go a little bit, that maybe having a, a, a circumscribed and totalizing sense of order isn't the ideal way to go about uh, constructing uh, things. Um, yeah, if I can come in, uh, thank you very yeah, much yeah, yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah, yeah, no, your no, comment no. is, can you hear me? Ultimately, your comment is on ghost as an image, a ghost as a metaphor. But believing in ghosts as ghosts may also mean something else. So in that sense, I raise that question. But the mm-hmm. way you have uh, answered it is absolutely fine. We are on the same page. No differences at all. Okay. I mean, th- that's the thing about the ghost, and I think you're right. It it escapes, it eludes, you know. The way the ghost is used here, of course, can should be put in confrontation with, with other ways that the ghost manifests and, and can uh, and what it can do. And so 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 I would say yes, we're on the we're on the same page here. Uh, it it's not totalizing in any sort of uh, uh, way. It shouldn't be at least. Okay, let's see. There's so many good questions. Uh, in what ways do ghosts of lost futures haunt us? Futures that were promised in the past and then eventually canceled, or whose possibilities have slowly eroded? I, I love that question. Um, History and Theory is currently running something called the Hu- Historical Futures uh, Project, which is a series of uh, articles uh, that are taking up precisely these sorts of, of uh, uh, issues and problems. They do haunt us. The, the, the lost future does haunt us. The lost future um, sometimes actually deactivates us uh, because when we lose a future, sometimes we then can no longer imagine a future. And so then the only futures, this would be, uh, Francois Artaug's argument about our enduring present, uh, the lost future forces us back to only imagine past futures uh, rather than be able to actually construct something new uh, that, that take us forward. Um, and so this is where what ends up happening is it's not just those past futures uh, that have eroded, but in fact the possibility of a future erodes if one uh, holds on to it. I'd say the haunting part would be precisely the way to realize that spectral nature of it, that it wasn't a teleology promised. In fact, it was a ghost that visited us and may visit us again. Uh, If one does that, then, of course, one doesn't fall into the despair of the promise that wasn't fulfilled. That's a very modernist sort of notion, Uh, but instead allows one uh, to imagine the way uh, that these promises, these futures and pasts, come and go and one might then be able to regenerate an energy uh, from a past future that otherwise uh, might seem forlorn Uh, so that's an attempt at that okay Uh, what do you think about the writing of history by moving between text testimonials and visuals also between the tactile and the oral and the recorded material of sound okay Uh, Santanu Das's India Empire and First World uh, War Culture uh, 2018. I, I think that's um, where we're going. Uh, there's a book coming out by Shazad Bashir about Islamic temporality. It will be an online book. It doesn't have a physical form. And it is precisely this sort of um, attempt to incorporate testimony, visual, uh, oral, uh, musical uh, into the argument itself. Uh, and I think that actually um, is where history needs to go. Uh, as, as We need to learn to construct our arguments in different modes, uh, precisely to be able uh, to move between these modes and between these different logics. Uh, and in in a, a piece I wrote for uh, a blog called Theory, Hist- uh, Theory at Work, 
uh, I talk about polyphonic history, and that's the ability to listen to all these different ways. And so, um, to my mind, that's what we should be doing in history and theory. One of the things we spend a lot of time doing is clearing the platforms and trying to create spaces in which these sorts of interventions can occur because publishers aren't ready for them. Uh, but that's what I think. That's what I think needs to happen. So I'm, I'm, I think that's right. I think uh, uh, India Empire and First World War cultures, precisely that amalgamation. Now let's break it out of the uh, the, the codex, the book itself. Okay. So let's see this question. I would like to ask whether in writing the past, one necessarily conjures the specter, or is it the spectral as an absent presence, already a condition of the past, as an opening of closure? That is. Is it in writing and rewriting that the specter becomes or does it precede the writing? I, I would say the specter precedes the writing. I think the, 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 the past haunts us in lots of ways. Um, what we write about is actually what we make, what we manifest. What, if we would think of historians as mediums uh, who are conjuring ghosts, if you will, uh, we conjure the ghosts uh, so as to then make visible what, what we found, what's presented itself to us. But there are remnants, there are remains, there are other aspects that, uh, that are dormant and are likely latent in the very history we write uh, and that can be made manifest. Um, so I do think the, uh, uh, the, 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 the ideal writing of the, uh, that, I, that I speak about is one where you really are trying to craft a space where those very things that are outside of your grasp uh, have the possibility of appearing. Uh, but I would say they precede the writing. It's not necessary. I mean, the, it, actually, it's a little, I, I think they precede the writing, and then they live in the writing. They haunt the writing. So even when you try to hold them down, this you know would be E.P. Thompson. He has this you know in the making of the English working class, he brought to present that which wasn't there. But of course, women were absent, and yet their absence was conspicuous in a way that made them presence for later historians. Okay, so let's see. Uh, here we go. I want to know your views on to what extent a place can haunt us. If we talk about places uh, devastated by continuous wars, violence, deaths, ruins, how can we have a hauntological approach to these haunted or spectral landscapes? If any, another very good question. And and I, I think places uh, really haunt us perhaps uh, at times more than anything else. Uh, you feel something in spaces. And this is where, uh, you know, I'm... I, I'm interested in this phenomenon of presence uh, in ways perhaps different than uh, uh, Gumbrecht and Ankersmith, but nonetheless, I, I walk between presence and a more constructivist understanding, precisely because I do think these landscapes uh, have remains uh, that do surge up to meet us and that it's up to us to be able to, to work through them. You know, the, the ones that we know what happened, the places we know what happened, those in some ways are low-hanging fruit, and I, I think that's because the the the, uh, the devastation is apparent to us. The trauma is apparent to us, and and those we we seem to be able to take up in in more or less sophisticated ways. The more difficult ones are those precisely those areas where where the the, the trauma, the violence, um, uh, is actually uh, buried or hidden, and nonetheless haunts us in various ways, comes up in various ways. Uh, and those, that's that attunement that I, that I, I want to speak to, kind of a listening uh, to what isn't obviously there or what, what's, what seems to be missing, uh, a counter-reading uh, to, to the narrative presented. Uh, and I think that spaces are, you know, uh, walking the space, inhabiting the space, of course, learning the history of the space. The, these are ways of, of getting into it. They are all, to my mind, haunted and so you do need to really understand the spectral nature of of the landscape now how one does this you know i think that actually is is particular uh, to the landscape on which you walk and of course the events that happen there are the events you don't know happen there that's part of the 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 thing that that makes uh some scholars quite frustrated with my approach is when you when you tell someone to look for something that isn't there of course, the mode by which one one looks for something that isn't there or knows how to address it uh, is is never obvious. But but that's part of what I'm suggesting is we need to be more open to the plurality of possibilities uh, rather than going in thinking we know how to deal with them each time. So uh, let's see. Okay, 
Do I believe that haunting history is a history of insert uncertainty, a history of fragility, and a history without history, preparing us for a future of disfiguration and which is uh, and which is more incorporeal in outcome? Hmm. Well, it certainly is a history uh, of fragility. It is certainly a history of fragility. The, the the fragility of it all is one of the things that I I think is is most important because, you know, history has been uh, a narrative of dominance for the most part. Uh, it's been about being able to say what you know and to make things certain. And I think a certain amount of fragility or humility, as I uh, described in the paper, uh, is warranted uh, because history is fragile, and it's fragile not only. Uh, in ways that are uh, problematic. This is to say it's fragile to the people whose history seems to be rendered aside or buried below. But I think the positive side is that the dominant modes of history are equally fragile. And if one is aware that the dominant modes of history are equally fragile, then that might give one hope for uh, intervening, overturning, toppling, uh, contesting in a political way. Uh, and so this... Uh, I mean, is it a history without history? It's a different mode of history. I mean, certainly in the surge, if in haunting history, I was trying to reach some sort of a, a, a ground or discussion uh, with uh, the historical profession in the surge, I'm saying I'm asking for something else. I actually think in our moment of post-truth, and I gave a, a lecture at Bielefeld about this, what I call the end time of truth. I don't think the uh, authority of the expert holds sway in the way it did. And if we're going to confront the past in a way that's adequate to our, our, our moment, this moment, it may not be all of ours, but some of ours, this moment, uh, then we need to rethink, we need to rethink history. Uh, we need to rethink our approach to the past, and we need what I would call a new compass of history guiding us uh, toward an understanding that's not beholden to a correspondence theory of truth, but actually allows for multiple logics that force themselves into contestation so that no one can rest on the top of the hierarchy. Uh, is that incorporeal? I don't know. I mean, it's spectral. It's spectral, so uh, it means that corporality is not all there is, uh, but it also means that it's not a pure simulacra. It's not purely virtual. Uh, it, it, it is and isn't uh, very much so. <laughs> I think I got the questions in the chat. I'm not sure if there's any others or if, Ron John, you have uh, some final thoughts. <laughs> Well, yes, um, I think we are done. Um, I think I have actually um, written out in the chat box that we are probably not in a position to take any more questions. So, and Ethan has been talking for a lot of time. It's more than 90 minutes. So it's like a huge conversation that we had. I'm extremely happy that uh, his, uh, his talk generated such a lot of interest. And uh, Boy Lecture Series is primarily meant to be very interactive because... Uh, we expect not a very formal lecture to be presented. We always expect that there is an interaction, more provocative points being thrown out. And also, uh, uh, people can be, can be encouraged or probably inspired to think a little transgressively, a little tangentially. And uh, that is exactly what this talk has really done tonight, because Ethan has been able to raise so many haunting dots that it's now up to everyone to really just about doodle the dots and see what kind of a figure they might get. And all those figures, I'm pretty sure, will be very different. So uh, thank you, everyone, for presenting. And it was a very solidly attended event. And I'm extremely happy that uh, all of you found such a lot of interest, uh, especially in a, in a book and in a speaker who strictly doesn't belong to the English department. We organized that from the Department of English. But as I said, the Boy Lecture Series is not on a boy or a book that only belongs to literature per se. It can be from philosophy, it can be from history, anthropology and the rest. So, um, which is the reason why uh, our next speaker uh, of the boy lecture series would be Ethan Balibar, who is going to talk in the month of May. So you exactly know that we are really trying to diversify things so that people of different strain and stripes and backgrounds and contexts can come in and enjoy this talk. And I'm extremely happy that all of you really 
enjoyed this as I can see that from a lot of comments coming up in the chat box. And Ethan, thank you so much for being on this program. And it's been a long time desire to see you on this Boy Lecture Series. And I hope that you enjoyed the evening as much as we did. Thank you so much. Well, I have to say it, it was a wonderful opportunity. I, I hope I didn't go on too long, but uh, I was very excited to share with you. And of course, I, I wanted to talk about so many things. So it's, uh, it's, it's always a, a pleasure to do so. I have to say that the questions were fantastic. So uh, they, they resonate. They're so smart. Uh, and as you say, they, they point in, the, in directions one can go. And that's really the ideal, right? To like figure out where we can take this, how we can all get a little more radical and more interdisciplinary in our approach. And so I really value... Uh, this invitation, this opportunity, and I thank you all so much uh, for attending. So this was this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you, and good night, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.